afternoon. Herding cats becomes harder and harder as the day wears on. The next talk is Arctic Watch by John Orcutt. All yours, John. Uh, thanks very much, Peter. I'm going to talk about uh, a thing that we have called uh, Arctic Watch, and it follows on a lot of the talks this afternoon uh, about uh, prospects of of actually uh, making uh, long-term measurements in the uh, in the Arctic. Uh, several people are involved in this thing. A few, a couple of years ago, a bunch of us uh, meeting in Vancouver agreed to write a paper. Uh, on this issue, and the first author was Peter Mikulewski, and you can see many. That, and I've listed the people that are actually at this meeting that participated in uh, in writing this uh, this paper. Uh, it was published in Arctic in 2014, and uh, I will describe briefly what this looks like and what we have in mind. It's fairly expansive, uh, and that it proposes to place a number of uh, measurement devices in the Arctic Ocean, but uniquely uh, the plan is to run a fiber optic cable with power from Barrow, Alaska through the North Pole to Longyearbyen. And we're obviously working a lot with uh, the Norwegians on this, and uh, it's, it's rather um, uh, a uh, large and not inexpensive idea. The cost um, that we worked out, a, a, a rough cost of just laying the cable across the pole um, here with uh, TE Subcom was the uh, the people that I worked with on this and the, the cost of laying that cable is about a hundred million dollars. Now that doesn't include any instruments on the system so you can easily double that to 200 million. But when you think about the cost of a new icebreaker, that's a very small fracture of, fraction of a, uh, the cost of an icebreaker itself. And we're talking, we're thinking, I guess, as a country of building two or three icebreakers, maybe four during the coming decade or more. Uh, there has actually been talk in Congress about getting this done. As you know, presently now, we really don't have a U.S. I icebreaker that's uh, uh, able to manage full um, uh, ice in the Arctic. We have some, uh, the uh, NSF has a ship called the Sekuliak. Uh, the Healy is uh, operated by the uh, Coast Guard who operates most of the uh, icebreakers, but none of them are actual icebreakers or ice strengthened, but are not capable of doing uh, full ice impacts. So uh, the cost is high. Uh, on the other hand, the gain is great uh, in this project, and one of the reasons uh, that cable runs where it is is that you can run a cable from borrow the U.S. part of this in, uh, uh, wedge of influence here through the North Pole uh, to Norway uh, and not intrude upon any other country's uh, future territory or regions of uh, influence. We have not signed the Law of the Sea Treaty itself. Canada has, Norway has, of course, but uh, the U.S. has not signed this thing. So the U.S. right now is not eligible to make uh, that claim. But the, uh, the organization, the Arctic Council, recognizes this as uh, a wedge uh, that has major U.S. interest and abuts uh, U.S. territory in Alaska. Uh, there are a lot of reasons uh, to do this. Uh, uh, we know from the talks that we've heard, particularly today, that we are in a uh, time in which there's a profound uh, transformation happening in the Arctic. It raises a lot of national security, geopolitical, and economic issues when we think about it. I'll talk about that a bit more. It's a great opportunity to better understand the global climate system not necessarily a popular thing today either, uh, but it, uh, pr we would propose to investigate the feasibility of, of laying a trans-Arctic uh, cable and a sensor network in the system that would operate continuously uh, for at least 25 years' time, uh, bringing data back from a variety of different uh, sensors. And so it would be 
year-round, it'd be real-time, uh, would not depend upon ships once uh, laid, except for repairs, of course, uh, which would be inevitable. But first I'll talk, and, and uh, Peter uh, Wadham's already talked a lot about this, uh, earlier, but this the idea of the, the declining sea ice extent. Um, the uh, uh, I'm going to show you some some data here that are relevant uh, to this. Uh, the uh, multi-year ice is uh, is declining rather rapidly in uh, the four-year ice, for example, in in uh, 1988 covered 26 percent of the Arctic and today it's less than seven percent so that the multi-year ice the really thick ice is uh, is almost gone I think Peter Wands uh, made that comment and it's quite true um, and there are predictions that uh, with the Arctic Ocean might be ice free in the summer months as early as 2020 I suspect that won't be this early but it will be uh, within many of your uh, lifetimes, but it is an opportunity uh, to, as as the last speakers talked about, it's an opportunity to really um, observe its major transition on Earth's surface and in the uh, surface in the uh, the climate system over the next several years, and we should take advantage of that to understand it well, to understand eventually how we may be able to or the uh, Arctic would recover ice in the future uh, once we stop releasing so much gas into uh, CO2 in particular into the atmosphere and methane from the uh, permafrost. Uh, 2012, as Peter had mentioned, most of you know is a new uh. record or a, and it stands at this point, although we're only about a month, a little more than a month away from finding out whether uh, we exceed uh, the 2012 record or not, and I'll give you a, you'll take a look at some graphs in a movie that I've got that uh, uh, you can make your own judgment. Um, the five smallest ice extents on record have happened in the last seven years, kind of like global temperature. Uh, here we're setting records annually uh, with this. This is not quite annual in this case. But there has been a substantial change in the way the ice is behaving. Um, so this is a really ugly slide, um, but it, it, it is the data that has been collected by uh, the National Snow, Ice and Snow uh, Center over the last uh, 39, almost 39 years. Uh, starting in 1978, uh, uh, microwave emissivity was used to estimate the ice coverage in the Arctic and they have dutifully uh, published every month a average for that month of ice extent in the uh, in the Arctic and the reproducibility the the uh, the viability of that uh, or the suitability of that measurement is quite high uh, and accurate but this uh, this is a plot of all those data and one of the really important things and the, another reason to actually do a long, uh, something like a cable in the Arctic is that in order to understand climate, you have to have a very long time series that you're confident in. Uh, climate cycles happen slowly. Uh, maybe uh, you can verify climate change in some way if you average or measure something over a 25 year period. So in order to understand climate, you can't say, well, that uh, hurricane this month was really a bad thing, it must be climate, but you have to have a measure you can make over a long time that you have certainty that there really is a change in the Earth's behavior. And 25 years is a pretty good estimate for the, for the uh, time period that we're looking at. And this time period actually extends to nearly 40 years at this point, and NASA and NOAA have done an excellent job of maintaining these observations. It's certainly not the same satellite, but satellites were able to be intercompared over time as they were replaced to verify that the measurements were making sense on both satellites before one went out of service. So there's, there's quite a lot of uh, 
uh, confidence in these measurements. And so this is, this is the result of all that work. And in that sense, all that money over the years, you can see where the points are. It's fairly jagged, uh, not smooth. And the stuff at the top here is basically the winter time. The, the, uh, the maximum ice extent generally happens in March. Uh, when uh, in the winter time, in the middle of the winter, and so it's this uh, this green plot at the top, and then uh, the uh, ice uh, then melts over uh, the summertime, and the, usually the minimum, and in fact always the minimum uh, occurs in September, and you can see this uh, thing that uh, Peter Wallace mentioned in 2012 was this minimum ice extent shown down here. Uh, there was another significant change in 2007. But if you look at about uh, 1995 to 2000, you can see things are fairly flat here. But then things do change. There is a substantial change in the way the Arctic uh, is behaving at about that time. It looks and. You know, for uh, Peter Michalewski's talk, he showed some uh, indications uh, in Hane as well of, of warm water input to the system that has begun to change that. And so there, there, is, there are other data that are consistent with these observations of the ice. Um, one of the easier ways to see this, and this something I had fun with, was uh, was this polar diagram. And I found out after I'd done it, of course, that others done it before I did, but uh, there's 12 months on here. This is uh, January, February, the coldest uh, and most highest I ex uh, extents happen here. This is September when most of the thaw happens. And so I plotted all these 39 uh, um, points in a polar graph here. And so you make one circle of this thing for each year, and you'll see the color uh, will show up up here right now. Uh, this is the first measure that was made. Uh, this is the second measurement here back in 1978 at the end of the year. And so we'll, we'll fill this in as we go around here and see how the Arctic actually involves. And this is shown in percent of um, of uh, the highest ice extent, which happened in March of 19, uh, well, 1979 uh, here. So that I just divided everything by the extent at that point. And so this is percentage ice cover. And it goes from 0, uh, 80 to 100 uh, percent here. So I'll just let this thing go, I hope. Well, that didn't work. Don't look at that thing yet. There we go. So that's red, green, 1980. Uh, you can see uh, that uh, this is 100% out here. The uh, the maximum ice, ice uh, the maximum melting happens here in September. You see, it gets flat here during the summertime between July and uh, and maybe November when the recovery of the ice uh, goes again. And this is 1990 now, closing up, and, uh, and you can see as time goes on here, even out here, that even in March the uh, the inexorably, the ice cover has moved from 100 percent down to something like 90 percent, but it's changed even more down here, uh, and we're approaching that max, uh, that interesting 2,000 mark here, and you begin to see change happening more often. You see that the the melt uh, has been dis has been uh, uh, increasing uh, with time here we see that uh, 2005 we had the incursion here in 2007 there was a significant change uh, here and the melt has extended substantially over the months down into uh, November so the uh, this is the percentage this is 20 percent right here we're down to 
on the order of 20% uh, ice cover uh, at this point. And uh, 2017, we're still, the last point I have is in July here. August will show up uh, in a couple of days because the month will be over and no one will do their job and they'll declare another point here. And in uh, November, it'll be possible to see whether that, ex that uh, blip at 2012 uh, is actually exceeded. And we obviously, I think, Peter Wattams, I think probably everybody in this room expects that it will uh, continue to decrease. Whether it actually d sets a new record this year or not, I think is equivocal. Uh, it's not clear to me right now that there's enough, me enough early melt to actually break that record, but it will happen. And that will continue to happen until there is an ice-free summertime uh, here, not in the distant future, uh, probably even in my life, and that's going to happen. Um, and uh, and the uh, the ice out here in March uh, has decreased uh, not to 20 percent, but it's something on the order of 15 percent loss, even in the uh, winter time of year. And the other thing that has happened is that the uh, um, the the uh, multi-year ice has uh, nearly disappeared at this point in time. Uh, I found in some shipping news that I got last month that there was a new ship uh, called the Christophe de Marjorie who happens to be a uh, past president of Total, uh, the uh, oil and gas company in, in um, uh, France. But this is uh, owned by uh, by Russia, and it's a, a LNG tanker, and this was in the New York Times last weekend. Uh, it's a rather large ship. It's 300 meters long. Uh, the uh, Athorg ships, it measures 50 meters, have, well, more than half a football field. Um, it we can, uh, it's ice hardened, so it can break 1.5 meters of ice. Um, the Sekuliak, the NSF ship, which is many, almost, well, orders of magnitude smaller than this, can break three quarters of a meter. And so this is a 1.5 meter ice strengthened uh, ship that last month um, made a trip from Norway on the northeast passage above Russia to deliver LNG to Korea. And uh, there are 14 more of these ships that are on order. These are all Russian-owned, Russian-contracted uh, uh, vessels, and uh, I guess they'll be uh, named after presidents of uh, oil and gas companies. I don't know what, the, what this will be, but that's where the first one went. And it's fairly appropriate uh, that the New York Times uh, noted it is quite unusual that uh, we're hauling LNG across the planet rather than going south, we're going north uh, and delivering more methane and, and gas to Korea and other places in Asia that will ensure that as we burn it off that the ice gets thinner and thinner. So we have this, this positive feedback thing uh, going on here with shipping in the uh, in the Arctic, and uh, uh, Vladimir Putin is apparently very very pleased with this whole idea. Uh, this is a uh, picture of the uh, Crystal uh, Harmony. Uh, it's actually a ship I've actually been on with my wife, uh, but in the Mediterranean. But last year, it uh, made a passage in the Northeast Passage, going from west to east uh, in the uh, in uh, September uh, last year in basically an ice-free environment. So a ship of that size, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Christophe is uh, substantially larger than this, but nevertheless, ships of this size can routinely now pass uh, through that particular time of year from one side to the other, the north northeast passage. So that's not a tiny ship either. I mean, it's a pretty small cruise ship as cruise ships go. It's one of the smaller, smallest, but uh, apparently when they announced they were going to make this route, the, uh, all the rooms sold out in 48 hours, which is a pretty remarkable thing. So this is what's happening uh, now with the Arctic. Um, there, uh, 
this is a Norwegian uh, organization uh, uh, here that made this uh, map. But they showed the, uh, the resources that are available in the Arctic. And the estimate from this and their analysis is that the, the, the petroleum resource in the Arctic range up to 22% of the world's remaining undiscovered hydrocarbons. And so there will be probably uh, lots of exploration going on in the Arctic uh, starting very soon. We've seen uh, many or at least two failed attempts to uh, drill from the U.S. in the Arctic, but I suspect this will continue. I know certainly Russia will uh, continue to push this. Um, yeah, you can read that for yourself, but this just shows uh, some of the challenges for the future uh, here. Uh, the future central uh, Arctic route when the uh, the, uh, the ice basically disappears sometime in the next uh, 10 to 20 years here will provide a, a route for shipping in both directions through the Northwest Passage um, here and we'll have to see how important that becomes. One can imagine that there are uh, economic gains to be made in moving LNG from Norway to, uh, to um, um, South Korea, but it's a little harder to imagine that it will have a big impact on shipping, let's say, from Singapore to Los Angeles or through the canal to the East Coast and on to Europe. Uh, the gains are not necessarily that large, and some time ago, uh, at least a, a senior pr a president of uh, um, a major shipping, uh, Lonnie Kverner, made a, made a statement that he felt that the Northwest Passage was never going to be terribly important for the global economy. So we don't really know the answer to that yet, but we do see that there are opportunities like the uh, building of these uh, 15 new LNG tankers, and those represent substantial uh, challenges for uh, the Arctic. Uh, I think I probably covered these. Um, we, of course, yeah, this was mentioned too by uh, Sonia. Uh, the uh, melting of the Greenland ice sheet uh, is happening rapidly, which actually uh, raises uh, sea level in like the Arctic. Um, uh, lots of oil and gas possibilities uh, in the Arctic. Certainly shipping has already become important. Perhaps mining fisheries will likely uh, uh, be important. I believe that uh, well, China does actually have an icebreaker or two that, and they do visit now the Arctic uh, annually. Tourism, we've seen that happen already, and uh, people are anxious to go see the Arctic while it's there, and they'll probably continue to do that. So, the increase in economic and political importance uh, uh, and defense is uh, is. Uh, is a real concern, I believe, to the to the country. Um, so that's that part of my story. But the other part is uh, some years ago, and this is uh, particularly uh, because Walter was so involved in it. There's an organization uh, that was established some years ago. Um, uh, several of us were asked to go to a meeting, which we did, and uh, at the time, Senator. Gore's uh, office building in the Senate, uh, and we met with him for a day and a half here, and he, he has had a major interest in um, uh, developing a program which would use information from uh, the uh, intelligence systems in this country to understand better climate. And you may recall as well that uh, Al Gore uh, was one of Roger Revelle's students when he was at Harvard and really changed his entire life. And so uh, he has paid a lot of attention to climate and still does today. But his idea as a senator back then was to start an organization like this. And Bob Gates uh, was at the time the director of CIA and he was at the meeting as well. And they uh, agreed to do this, and the organization is called Medea. Many of you have heard of Jason, 
this is Medea, and they're uh, related to this mythology. Um, and Medea was formed, and about 60 uh, scientists were cleared for uh, the kinds of clearance one needs to have to work directly with all the data and instrumentation at the uh, at the intelligence services, and so it was. It was sponsored basically by the Central Intelligence Agency, and uh, this became a, a really an interesting uh, undertaking. Learned a lot about systems and also a lot about the world's uh, climate. Um, the uh, as soon as the um, um, election uh, uh, brought uh, George W. Bush into the, uh, into the presidency, uh, the, the funding disappeared overnight, and so for eight years everything went dark and nothing happened, and it was reinstated again later. Uh, uh, Leon Panetta became the director of CIA, and Medea began its work uh, again on this, and we had all uh, stayed around by and large and uh, went back to work uh, doing this rather interesting stuff. And I think Walter uh, commented the other day, or someone did, that um, one of the things we had set up before all this happened is we, put, we, we looked at a bunch of points on Earth, and one of them was uh, places that would be interesting for measuring sea level. And uh, so the the system began to collect data for all these things which we called fiducial points and they'd make two to three to four uh, observations every year and nobody told them to turn it off uh, after it was defunded so they kept making these measurements when we came back we had another eight years of measurements uh, and there was it is still happening it's still still going on and, and uh, the data are in fact available to scientists uh, through the geological survey uh, here. The problem is the survey doesn't have any funding to transform the imagery uh, into things that can be open to the general public. And so we have the money does matter at one point, but at least in this issue of collecting data over a long period of time, that continues to happen. And so climate, like everything, you have to have systems that are well calibrated they have to operate for a very, very long period of time. Those are expensive things to do. Uh, but without those data and without this collection capability we have, we uh, have a real problem. But anyway, I have, uh, um, I hopefully have a piece of a documentary that was made uh, that includes uh, Walter here talking about the Arctic, so I'll see if I can get this to go. See where there. And that's why the ice albedo feedback uh, is such a strong feedback to a climate system. This is just showing you albedo and how it depends upon how much ice is there and how quickly the Arctic warms. The ice, as it is this, affected uh, by a, a warmer temperature, tends to crack and move in small, very small is, uh, areas. Jim Baker, and for example, the satellites, the intelligence was, uh, satellites were able to show us that we could see small rivulets. Of, of water and how they would grow the and how they would decline and then how much water was flowing, for example. This detailed study of the Arctic sea ice made possible by the intelligence satellites is critical to understanding the potential for Greenland glaciers to melt. If the sea ice is there, it kind of buttresses the end of the outlet glacier and, and basically poses a little bit of restraint on the amount of calving that can go on. It's a little bit of a stopper. So if the sea ice goes away, there's some concern that these outlet glaciers will basically flow more easily into the ocean, break off, go off as icebergs and melt and raise sea level.
The estimate is that if all of Greenland's glaciers would melt, it would add nine meters of global sea level. Changes occurring in the Arctic caused concern in the American team that a major problem could occur in the other pole of the Earth. There is some evidence from paleoclimate that during the last interglacial period, sea level rose very rapidly in a very short period of time. And that rise could only have happened due to a major collapse of one of the major ice sheets, potentially on Antarctica. Okay, now, I don't think anybody wants to predict that that's going to happen, but the potential of a major release of ice from Antarctica globally would be incredibly disastrous. I think that we don't really know the time scale as well. People are thinking two meters at the end of the century. And I don't think that nasty surprises are, are totally impossible. The total water, sea level rise associated with Greenland glaciers is about nine meters. And the total sea level rise associated with Antarctica is of the order of 100 meters. In order to understand better the pace at which melting ice is increasing sea level, Medea turned its spy satellites to specific worldwide points of strategic importance. One is the beachfront located just south of San Diego. That's me. I'll stop. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> I'm standing looking at the sea. I, uh, I, had a, I had a few speaking parts there, but I'm not going to bother with that. I mean, this was part of the celebration of Walters is the, uh, the work that's been done in oceanography and climate and, as you noticed, uh, national security. And in so many cases, we found, have found, because of the uh, requirement that we understand well long time series uh, availability, that uh, national security and climate issues become closely entwined. And uh, the Navy, for example, with which both Walter and I are most familiar has a uh, huge investment in, in what happens in climate uh, in future years. The sea level is going up. Norfolk, if any of you have been there recently, is a very watery place these days. Um, it uh, floods often. Uh, Mari Lago is threatened, heaven help, uh, here in Miami. Um, but these issues come together. Uh, at many places, and this is, I think, Walter's view uh, since the landings in, uh, in D-Day uh, through today. Um, this has been an important part of what he's done in his life. And so it's for that reason I bring up the uh, national security issues. I remember when I was, I just, uh, when I was in Annapolis, uh, in my junior year, we went to Norfolk to learn how to do uh, landings, and uh, they had a big, thick operations manual there, and, and I kept running into this name, Monk, um, everywhere in this document here, but we were all uh, schooled in how to actually engineer a, uh, a landing from landing craft and helicopters and so on, then had to go out and practice it and get really wet one day uh, to see how this actually worked. Uh, this doesn't seem to be a future of operations in uh, the military any longer, but for many, many years, this ability to predict uh, the waves and so on, the idea of significant wave height and so on that was invented for that purpose uh, became a very important part of the national security uh, capability of the country and vice versa, and it really provided an opportunity for 
the involvement of oceanographers, physicists, and, and so on through these various organizations to help tie together the nation's national interests uh, in many different kinds of ways, including climate. Thanks.